Hello Serie A fan. Baseball caps are out and scarves are back in. The sack race is over as Yakini is let go, but the title race is wide open as five of the seven sisters drop points. Elsewhere, Lazio's legal team are busy, Conte's had one too many, and Zlatan sets new records for goals scored and penalties missed. We discuss all that and more on this episode of Scudetto. Hello Serie A fan. Another international break looms. Milan, two points clear at the top of the table. And we've got our first casualty in the sack race. Kenny called this one right. Um, Fiorentina and Iacchini part ways. We'll be discussing that and rounding up all the other action. But first of all, let's do some beers. Kenny, um, what have you got to celebrate your correct prediction this evening? Ah, oh, you make me sound like such a cold-hearted person. Um, <laughs> not not to celebrate, but because we do it every week. Uh, I have got, I do have a beer. Uh, it's a Tempest Brewing Company again, uh, but this time it's the Pale Armadillo uh, Session IPA. I've I've come down from my six percenter last week. Uh, I'm at a uh, a safe three point eight percent this week. It's supposed to be citrusy, tropical, and earthy, according to to the tasting notes, which uh, I found online. But I'll let you know if that translates. Lovely. Uh, have you? We'll come back to you. In fact, later in the podcast to see if you can find a. Uh a different adjective to describe it this week as well. It's quite nice. <laughs> and Paz, what have you got? I've got that uh, 7%er I name dropped last week. The Milan game was particularly frustrating last night, so this time I'm taking a leaf out of your book and uh, I'm going to try this extra strong beer. It's called, uh, sorry, it's called uh, IPA and that. It's a pretty bold naming. Yeah. Um, well, I've got a Saima, which is a dark lager. I'm about to pour it out and see how dark it is, but I think it's pretty uh, pretty black. I can get the reaction from these guys. Almost looks stout-like. Yeah, but it is fizzy. But yeah, it tastes quite malty. That's my first impression, but I'll let you know how that goes down. Anyway, yeah, first up, uh, let's just reactions to the news, Kenny. Um, what do you make of it? Yeah, so Prandelli uh, has been announced. All of this was breaking, I should say, in the the moments before we were uh, ready to to go into to go into recording. Uh, but yeah, Prandelli is back at uh, Fiorentina, and uh, yeah, I think it's it, it should hopefully be. Uh, uh, a decent uh, appointment. Um, there, there were talks which perhaps excited a lot of Fiorentina fans of uh, Spalletti or Sarri possibly coming in. But obviously, given that this is uh, an interim until the summer, that is still uh, an option that potentially will be open to Fiorentina at the end of the, the season. I know that Spalletti uh, is still comfortably raking in 5 million euros a year from Inter until June anyway. So he probably won't be too disappointed to to sit on it for a bit. Sarri, on the other hand, cut ties with Juve a week ago formally. So um, we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. But in the short term, um, it looks like a, a, a sensible uh, appointment. And uh, yeah, that, that would be my take on it. Sure. Um, so yeah, we do think it's a good appointment. Uh, can you tell us about uh, Prandelli's last outing in Syria? Yeah, well, he was at Genoa until uh, the end of... 20, season 2018, 2019, was it? But yeah, actually, I think what's quite poetic about this is that his last match as a Genoa manager was in a nil-nil draw with Fiorentina. And uh, that point actually saved Genoa from, from relegation. Uh, Empoli, who finished tied with them on points, had a worse uh, direct matches or a scontro diretto uh, record against them. So they ended up Going down, undoubtedly, Fiorentina, I would say, was has been the height of Prandelli's uh, success. Really, as as a manager, he qualified, I, I believe it was three times for for the Champions League. Uh, well, it was twice, but one of those uh, an extra time, basically, when uh, obviously the whole Calciopoli scandal happened and they had that taken away from them. Decent record, well, very very good. First half as Italy manager, very bad second half, getting to the final of the Euros, which obviously ended calamitously, but then being knocked out in the, the group stages in that infamous game where uh, Suarez bit Chiellini. So yeah, yeah, looking forward to seeing him back, really. Yeah, always interesting when uh, a team goes back to a manager they've worked with before. Definitely be 
interested to see how he gets on. Um, and just on the actual game, obviously uh, they drew nil nil with with Palmer at the weekend. Uh, obviously, kind of been building for a while, but it was a pretty pretty bad performance. I think it'd be fair to say, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, it was just a dire game of football all round, really. I think there were eleven efforts uh, in the whole game. Four of those were on target, and that was between both sides. I think Parma arguably have have an excuse in that they're still, you know, the manager's still relatively new. There's still a lot of new players bedding in, but this is Yakini's second season, and I mean, Callejon was was out, uh, fair enough with COVID, but. Other than that, he started this game with Ribery, Castrovilli, Amrabat, Biragi, Milenkovic, Tagovsky, Pulgar. I mean, the, the the team was, you look at the players and it's just not good enough to come away with a nil-nil in that manner as well from that. Yeah, I mean, I think Yakini as well said at the end of the game how he saw the spirit that he wanted, only the final ball was missing. And I mean, that's a very rose-tinted uh yeah, he was doing Reviews a bit of revisionism again. with the previous results as well, wasn't he? Increasingly, he was looking like Chemical Ali. There is no problem here. There is everything <laughs> is all right. <laughs> and and you were thinking, uh, did you watch the same game that I watched? Did, did, I mean, Kenny called it, but uh, I think it was uh, it was it was a good call, Kenny. I give you a pat, on, a virtual pat on the back because uh, <laughs> when you when you mentioned it, I, I wasn't sure it would be him, but uh, spot on. I think um, for me, I think the thing that was the writing on the wall was when you saw him in that press conference. And yeah, as you said, Oscar, revisionism of previous results saying our first two games were very impressive. And his first two games, they won 1-0 against Torino. And then they threw away that lead against Inter to lose 4-3. So, you know, if that's your case for the defense, then you can see that, it, you know, what didn't take uh, didn't take the jury that long to reach their verdict. Uh, and speaking of managers who were... Uh a bit more impressed with the way their team performed than the result might suggest. Uh, Pirlo said that he liked the way that Juve approached the game, uh, a 1-1 draw with Lazio. Uh, not revisionism to the extent of Yakini, but perhaps he should be looking for a little bit more than that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. T- to be honest with you, Lazio have come into some decent form. Uh, strangely enough, since everything's been up against them, um, they appear to have turned it on a little bit and turned a corner, possibly. And if you th- consider the fact that Lazio are one of the teams that were challenging uh, Juventus, pushing them up until uh, lockdown happened, a draw away from home against Lazio is uh, no, it's not a bad result, really. The thing I think that probably, you know, is more damning for, for Juve is the way that they that they dropped that point, the fact that it was pretty much the last kick of the game from Caicedo. I think Pirlo admitted as much. Yes, he did say that he liked the way that they approached the game, but he also said matches are, are won in the detail um, and that Juve didn't manage the closing stage as well. I, I think that's a fair assessment. I think Juve... Probably, probably shaded it, but uh, but yeah, they didn't take their chances. They didn't didn't have that killer instinct. And for me, the game uh, turned on its head as soon as uh, Cristiano Ronaldo came off the pitch. It's not so much that uh, I felt the Juve players started playing worse, but it looked like the Lazio players gained in confidence and kind of were giving hundred and ten percent. Again, I guess psychologically to see uh, the star player for Juventus come off can be a big boost. On the other hand, there is this uh, Dybala issue where some of the fans are scapegoating him for the loss because essentially he lost the ball on the, near the halfway line from which Lazio went on and scored in the in the 94th minute. But to be honest, um, Lazio had to get past a few other players, including Rabiot and Bentancur and a few others on the way to that goal. So to pin it solely on Dybala, who is having a shocking time of it at the moment, but anyway, to to pin it just on him seems a bit uh, a bit extreme. Yeah, and also fair play to Pirlo for the way he defended Dybala. He said, "Well, if I've got, I think someone asked him if he was going to bend his ear after after the game, and he said, well, 'Well, I'm going to bend his ear. I've got plenty of other players' ears that I've got to bend as well.' Dybala might make uh, the odd mistake, but he's just coming back from a long time out. You know, he's he's still rusty, and that's." Fair enough. You know, we 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 spoke about how frustrated Dybala was to not be getting on the pitch, and 
yes, I that touch the where it ended up going out for the for the throw in. But I mean, that looked like a player who just wasn't really match fit. So yeah, great from Pirlo to to, to have said that. I think. And you have to consider that he was out for over a month with COVID, which is one of the longest periods I can remember for any active player. But in any case, um, we don't know how that affects his uh, physical state. We don't know we don't know where he's at exactly. And I think we're we may be underestimating what COVID is doing to some of these players. Yeah, except for Ronaldo and Zlatan. So glad you mentioned that Paz, because we do need to talk about the uh, COVID situation as La- at Lazio. Obviously, Kenny, you mentioned they've come back into some good form, seem to have kind of responded well to uh, the challenges that they've faced and that we've discussed. But they could be having a bit of an issue off the pitch. Uh, we mentioned last week that they might be facing legal action from the Federation. And uh, it doesn't look good, yeah. does it, Kenny? No, it doesn't look good at all. Um, as I said in our in our last pod, uh, it's it's an absolute shambles. It's total chaos. Um, Lazio test results are saying one thing, and it appears every other test, every other uh, testing center comes back with different results for for their players. I think it also, you know, not a very good look in this is that the Lazio team doctor Ivo Pulcini. Um, has now been a no-show at two summonses from uh, Fijici's, uh, prosec- the Fijici prosecutor's office, uh, and that's, that's uh, they might be they might be completely innocent, but it's not a good look. Maybe he's tested positive for COVID as well. He's self-isolating. <laughs> that's complete speculation on my part. <laughs> Don't sue me as well. I think that the interesting note on this as well is. We don't know. It's so early in the process that we've got no idea what the possible, um, you know, outcome could be for for Lazio. I know there were reports in the Gazzetta over the the weekend that there's a whole range of possible punishments that they could face. They could have a, a fine. They could have points deducted. They could even uh, apparently be uh, face expulsion from from the division. Uh, so yeah, it's I would say a, a big big shambles. Yeah, as if this season wasn't weird enough, we get some big point deduction or potentially even expulsion, mm. just messing things up. And you have to consider that um, this should be a wake-up call for Serie A as a whole. Uh, we've had a few COVID issues in the past. And interestingly enough, I think I'll drop it in here, but uh, today was the day when the the verdict for the infamous Juventus-Napoli game was supposed to come in. And of course, we haven't heard anything. And It's been postponed, I think. Of course. So uh, it's time for uh, time for both, for Serie A, for the Fiji to take things uh, a little bit more seriously, have a centralized uh, testing yeah. facility that yeah. uh, has a unique, uh, standardized way of uh, testing players. Because right now you had uh, Immobile supposedly playing against Torino when he was slightly ill. You And uh, I think that kind of brings the whole tournament into a bit of disrepute. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Obviously, whether it's whether it's a matter of clubs trying to bend the rules or whether it's a matter of just different testing systems returning different results, we can't have this situation where clubs are obviously trusted to, you know, report their own report their the own outcomes of their their own tests. Yeah, I can't find anything to argue with there. We do need to talk about one more game in this part, so let's move on to Milan. But as you revised your record last week, Milan hadn't lost a game since the birth of your son. But now they haven't lost a game in Syria. But it, it was definitely um, the record was under threat for a little while at the weekend, wasn't it? Ended up two two. But do you think they threw away a bit of a chance to capitalise while their rivals were dropping points? When I was watching the game live, I got the feeling that uh, I was very frustrated. It definitely felt like these were. Two points dropped, but now that almost 24 hours have passed, I, I think I've kind of revised my position. Milan, uh, they conceded two early goals, and I think the Milan of past would probably have capitulated at that point. Instead, they fought back with a lot of uh, energy. They got a goal back through Kessie, which was uh, a wicked deflection. His shot was going probably to the throw-in. In any case, for the whole second half, they really uh, piled on the pressure against the Verona side, who are one of the best defenses in the league. I think Mina had like 20 shots in the second half. Zlatan missed a penalty. Uh, Zlatan hit the bar. Zlatan had a goal 
from Calabria disallowed for handball and Zlatan scored in the 93rd minute. Uh, I have to say that in contrast with a lot of the reports I'm reading, I actually am going to be a little bit critical of Zlatan here. I feel that for the past um, three or four games, he's not really been at the top of his form. We didn't really re- mention this game much because it happened in between episodes, but Milan beat uh, Udinese 2-1 a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was through two Zlatan goals. One goal set up by Zlatan and one goal he scored. And again, he takes all the headlines, but realistically, even against Lille in the midweek, a lot of wayward passing. Also, he was getting very frustrated with, with his teammates, which I think actually he was getting frustrated with himself. Ultimately, you have to praise him for having the willpower and also for managing to get a goal in the, in such a late stage of the game, despite having such a shocker. But at the same time, as actually he, he joked himself, maybe it's time that someone else starts taking penalties because that's his third missed penalty in a row. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Is, is Latan the worst penalty taker in Serie A? I think statistically he's, he's the worst in all of the top five leagues in Europe, isn't he? Currently he's the worst. If I'm not mistaken, the stat is that he's the worst in the whole... Uh, of the calendar year, but it might be just just this season, which is a slightly smaller test case. And I should also say that in spite of his missed penalties, Zlatan is now the first player since the three points were introduced to score in seven consecutive games. And he's also now the 10th player to have scored the most in football history. And considering Romario's on that list and he's counting goals he scored in his own playground, that's a pretty good guy. And he did score a rebound from one of them. So from two of them, extra credit from two of them. Okay. So yeah, I mean, but at the same time, I think uh, it's starting to become a problem. It's uh, he, this one he blasted to uh, to the Terzonello at San Siro, where Kenny and I used to smuggle in from the top to the bottom. And uh, <laughs> usually, I'd say his cousin was up there or his brother, but the stadiums are empty, so there's not really no reason to hit the ball that high. Yeah, let's move on to that, actually. Uh, going on to honourable and dishonourable mentions. The first honourable mention is for Milan and Inter uh, for their uh, new stadium project, isn't it, Kenny? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Milan and Inter announced uh, this week that they've come to an agreement with uh, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan uh, to help finance the new stadium. And that is due to be completed, I think, uh, for twenty season 24-25. It might be 23-24. No, 24-25. So it's, a, it's an honorable and a dishonorable mention for me. It's honorable in that it's good to see that these stadium projects in Italy are moving forward. It's a dishonorable because it still feels a bit like a crime on uh, culture to me to, to knock down San Siro, even if you are retaining the, the ruins of it to create some sort of a monument. While we're on the San Siro, let's uh, just take maybe a favourite memory from you and Buzz. I have uh, visited the San Siro. I've never actually watched a football match in it, um, but I've had a look from the outside. Uh, but both of you guys have been there many times over the years. Buzz, you want to go first? Favourite memory? Actually, one of my best memories of uh, San Siro was when Milan won the league in uh, 1997. And Kenny and I, we were, we were young ones back then, but we smuggled a terrible football that was given out with uh, my my parents' washing liquid. And it was it was a ball that was like it didn't ha- it flew in the air, strange, and it was really not a good football. Let's put it this way. <laughs> and we decided that if Milan won the league on this day, we would kick this ball into the pitch. But of course, we were kind of young, so we kicked the ball and it bounced and it bounced and it bounced and somehow made its way on the pitch. And crazily, uh, Panucci took this ball and started doing kick- keepy-uppies with it. And he, he were, Panucci famously in his briefs, um, running around <laughs> with our ball. And next thing we know, there's like a bunch of fans like almost like hitting each other, trying to ask Panucci for this ball. And they're like, give it to me, give it to me. And it was like, it was crazy, and we're, Kenny and I were laughing because obviously we knew that this ball had no value. Uh, so that was one of my favorite memories. It had no value before it was thrown onto the pitch. Exactly. Too true. I seem to remember that Panucci liked running around in his pants after uh, as, as a means of celebration. I think he did the same in Athens when... Uh, 94. When we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to say, Boaz, give, give the game away. That's a bit for me. I was going to say... The the thrill, and this is going to make me out to, to be like a, a bit of a, a criminal here, but I like to think it's a, it's a very small crime. Basically going there as a, as a young kid with a 
bunch of mates buying the cheapest possible tickets we could for the third tier and then trying to to climb over and it was very very easy to do back then it was i think it was about three or four feet of plexiglass maybe like a five foot drop and then a two or three foot climb into the the second anello and uh yeah getting prime position really scary it was a little bit scary, I, and I suffered from vertigo. It's mainly scary, I think, because of how steep that, that third tier is. But I'll never forget. I'll never forget those games. They stuck a big gap between two of those areas, so I mean, it was it was a very deep gap, but you could easily step over it. But it was just really scary. I have another memory where it's slightly different, but um, I brought my first ever girlfriend to a Milan Inter. Actually, it was an Inter Milan game, and we were sat in the Milan end. But because it was an Inter home game and Inter were losing, the Inter fans smashed up the the stadium's uh, toilets and there was like pipes and sinks and all sorts of things flying onto the pitch. And she kept asking me what's going on. And I, I was trying to be calm and be like, yeah, don't worry, it's normal. But like literally it was carnage all around <laughs> us. <laughs> Good stuff. So we got pitch invasions, uh, criminal damage and trespassing into... Uh premium areas of the stadium and we didn't even used to hang out in the curva <laughs> i did in the fossa right we need to move on <laughs> uh, so kenny you've got an honorable mention for inzaghi yeah just for that wonderful assist really so i think it was marosic who was who picked the ball up after the infamous dibala incident we've spoken about and was looking to throw it back to one of the other defenders and simone, simone inzaghi literally just grabs him and wheels him round about 90 degrees and then shouts, throw it into the channel or something along those lines. And there's a wonderful video of this that uh, Lazio actually shared on social media, but I'm sure it was doing the runs from other people as well, of Inzaghi. You can see the whole thing happen. So him turning Marosic around and then sort of bobbing his head in excitement and watching really, really intently. And then as the goal goes in, he just goes absolutely nuts and pegs it down the, the line and dives in in the celebrations great fun great fun indeed and uh on that note Baz, you've got a honorable for samuletto yeah um inter triplete legend and uh former Sampdoria player um samuletto was involved in a quite nasty car crash back in his back in Cam- cameroon and uh oh, that's not some- great fun at all i've uh, misintroduced this one <laughs> First of all, the good news is that he's fine. He he hurt his head a little bit, but everything is cool. But even nicer is that he refused to press charges against the brush driver who smashed his uh, Land Rover. Top bloke. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, you've also got a dishonorable uh, for Serie A, I believe. I briefly alluded it, to it earlier, but it seems ridiculous to me that um, the Juve-Napoli verdict hasn't come out yet. It kind of affects the whole season, both for Napoli and Juventus. And I guess for the rest of the teams as well. And this is the kind of thing where the Italian league needs to start showing some sort of uh, initiative. Good stuff. Well, at least we're holding them to account. Uh, That's all we've got time for in part one. We'll be back. Hello, Serie A fan. Make Scudetto a part of your weekly football fix. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite listening platform. And follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Scudetto Pod. We'd love to have you on the squad. Welcome to part two, where we will discuss the rest of the weekend games, moan about VAR, and look ahead to the international break. But first, let's return to our hashtag civilized beers. Kenny, how's the uh, pale armadillo going down? It's going down quite well. I tend to think that the um, the session IPAs don't really have maybe as much... Uh, as much character as their full fat, uh, as their full fat brothers, but um, it's perfectly drinkable. It's nice and refreshing. A very, very drinkable beer. Fantastic Quite news. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you got away with it there. Baz, how's the Hetzel? It's uh, really, really strong. I'm a little bit tipsy. That's a good sign. Helped by the fact that le- I'm going to break the fourth wall, but we because these podcasts take about six hours to record we're each on our 10th beer so uh, that's the <laughs> truth that's not the truth not yet anyways this dark lager i mean it was growing on me after the third pint uh, no but seriously it's quite um it's quite strange always to drink dark beers because they taste not how you expect them to i think you always think they're going to be a bit maltier and kind of more bitter 
Uh, it's actually quite light and refreshing. That's uh, that's my review. Probably three and a half out of five. Isn't it? I'll give this one a four because it does its, it does what it's supposed to do. Get you get you drunk, basically. Well, it tastes it. good and it tastes like an IPA, but it 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 comes with a hammer to the back of your head. Get you for a podcast, definitely with you guys. <laughs> uh, okay, and on that note, let's talk about Atalanta Inter. Atlanta won into one. So two sides who were both quite unsettled coming to this game through kind of injuries, squad rotations, and just trying out new things to uh, blend new players into quite particular styles of play. Uh, Kenny, what was your reaction to the game? Yeah, I'm not sure that many people would agree with me, but I think there were actually mainly positive signs for both of the, the clubs to take out of this. So starting with Atalanta, because they were the home side, this was by some distance Romero's best performance in an Atalanta shirt. Uh, he looked a completely transformed player. They also appear to have found Gozin's deputy in young Ruggeri, who was excellent on his full debut. Miranchuk again looked great when he came on. He's now got two goals in a combined 41 minutes on the field for Atalanta. Freuler looked back to his solid best and Sportiello pulled off some top drawer saves as well. I think in summary for Atalanta, it was basically everything that was missing from the Liverpool game. Aggression, pressing, the tempo, it was all there uh, in abundance really. For Inter as well, uh, Vidal is really beginning to look like the player that Conte was kicking and screaming and throwing his toys out of the pram to get. Bastoni looking great. Lautaro seems to be coming back onto form after his grumpy spell at the beginning of the season. And Barella is just uh, a bit of a machine, really. Uh, he's, he's, he's great. They looked as well as a, as a unit. I thought they looked, for most of the game at least, really well drilled, uh, which they haven't maybe done so uh, defensively so much recently. They did kind of end up backs against the wall for the last sort of 10, 15 minutes after Atalanta got the equaliser. But even they could have put the game game to bed when Lautaro played Lukaku through. Uh, I think positive signs all round. As I said with Lazio Juve, these are two teams that are in the Champions League. It's not a bad result for Atalanta to get a point off of a game with Inter. It's not a bad result for Inter to, to get a, a point off of this Atalanta side away from home. Yeah, so a fair assessment. Um, I do have to reveal we had somewhat of a disagreement about our prediction for this game, didn't we, Kenny? Um, you thought that Atalanta were going to blow away the cobwebs from the Champions League defeat and uh, smash into 4-2. I was more on the side of Inter nicking a, a 2-1 win. I, neither of us were exactly correct. But it, it's actually probably Atalanta. They could have made deserved it, especially they they really should have had a penalty late on. I think that was an absolutely blatant penalty. I know that there have been some referees in Italy who do the media runs who have been explaining why, because D'Ambrosio's studs made contact with the elbow instead of the head, why that's okay. But I mean, the fact is, uh, Gosen's got punished for this against Ajax. I said at the time it was completely right. Um, his boot was high. Uh, D'Ambrosio has got absolutely no idea that um, no idea what's going on behind him. His his foot's high. His studs are showing. It's overhead height, and then then the foot drops uh, and makes contact with Miranchuk. I don't see in what world that isn't a penalty. And here here we are again speaking about VAR. But if VAR can't see that that's a penalty, then what is the point? Yeah, and I'm not sure what. The uh, justification was uh, certainly the commentary game um, that, that I was watching. It seemed like it was being justified because there was no contact with the head, but there was clear contact between studs and elbow. What, penalty for you as well, Baez? For me, it's a definite penalty. And what really bugged me was, was that on various shows that I listened to from Italy, this was pretty much brushed underneath the carpet. Like they said, oh, there was this chance in the last minute, not a penalty. and. At the very least, this deserved an in-depth chat. And I, again, I, we've some, we've all played football. I just don't understand how a player can get kicked on the shoulder, on the area between the the shoulder and the elbow, and that not be a foul. I mean, what what kind of game are we playing here? 
Yeah, and I think the point is as well that Miranchuk very definitely needs to take evasive action. He needs to back out to not get kicked in the face. I mean, how, on what planet is that not a penalty kick? I don't know. Because if he was really dedicated to the cause, he'd put his face in it. That This is what the refs want him to do. Maybe that's what they want. Draw the contact, yeah. But Gasparini was not as uh, not as concerned by this result as we were, maybe. Was it, Kenny? What did he have to say about it? Well, I wasn't personally concerned about this result. As I said, I thought a point, very decent result for, for both sides. Um, I did say going into the game that maybe there were early worrying signs for Atalanta um, after uh, that Liverpool performance. Uh, but yeah, Gasparini took a completely different view. He said, uh, I've got I've got this written down. He said, um, I've never had this feeling of crisis. We're up against expectations that Atalanta should be aiming to win the league and the Champions League. If others have these expectations, fair enough. But it's also fair enough for us to draw or lose the odd couple of games. Uh, fair enough, as Boaz mentioned, their, their playing budget. Um, I think we all did. Uh, perhaps maybe we did get a bit carried away, but um, I still think we can still speak about them as potential uh, title contenders. They do still need to turn it around a little bit, but this was a good, good early sign. And in the other dugout, Conte was uh, back on Conte form. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Conte was back to his grumpy best. Um, I love it. <laughs> he had to go at a reporter for daring to ask him if uh, he felt that he had got a response after the Real performance. And Boaz can complete this for me because I only uh, I, I only read the, the initial bit of the, res- the response, but I think Boaz has the, the whole thing. But in essence, he, he said something along the lines of, what are you talking about getting a response? Uh, we played a very decent game against Real Madrid. We were lucky, unlucky not to get uh, more from that game, the same in this game. Um, and then I think at this point I hand over to Boaz because I think Boaz has the real zinger. He seemed to take an exception to uh, it being suggested like we have done over and over again, that he's kind of mellowed out this season. And uh, essentially he said, to whomever says that Conte has mellowed out, I suggest you stop drinking wine and you cut out the grappa after your coffee as well, which was uh, quite, a, quite a zinger. Stop drinking those 6% IPAs, Boaz. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, Con- I'm sorry, Antonio. You can't tell journalists to uh, stop drinking and expect to get away with it. And, uh... and this, of course, prompted a fantastic response from a Gazzetta dello Sport journalist who wrote a pretty lengthy piece about why, A, he was in the right to criticize a Conte who has only won one of eight games, and why actually drinking wine is really good for you. So uh, very amusing all around. Excellent stuff and uh, kind of implicitly stood up for Christian Eriksen, I think, in that response as well, um, on these t- saying that he'd been criticizing his team selections. Uh, anyway, um, that's probably enough on that game. We should should move on to Roma, a team who have capitalized on the other contenders for the uh, top places dropping points, uh, a 3-1 victory away over Genoa. But as we're always worried, aren't we, when... Um, Jekko's not available and uh, he was out with COVID this time. But actually, they managed to do pretty well with, without a striker. Actually, they started with uh, Mayoral up top in Jekko's place, but looked more potent and scored two of their goals after they took him off and switched to a more fluid front three of Pedro Mkhitary and Cristante. Really impressive from, from Roma, didn't you think? Yeah, I think uh, if you consider that uh, Ro- Roma had uh, three points deducted for the very first game of the season without these three points who knows where they would be right now they they would have at least one extra point of course because they drew that game and low-key they've kind of been pushing they have a great defense and they score a lot of goals and i have to say that pedro has been a fantastic signing you have to remember that pedro was kind of the one of the leading players in that fantastic barcelona side and probably just a step behind the the, the messies and that level he also, apart from the previous season, he was really good for Chelsea as well. And I think uh, it's kind of a coup for uh, Roma. And he's, he's not even that old, so they could get a few more years for him. And of course, the star of this game was Mikatarian. He's showing the kind of form that he showed at uh, Dortmund and uh, that perhaps didn't quite uh, come through in the UK. As, as you said, the fluid formation is kind of slightly reminiscent of uh, the Spalletti era where the, there isn't really a reference point up front, but there is uh, a lot of movement. And I really enjoy watching them. Yeah, and I think uh, just to 
to expand on what you said, Oscar, I think there are teams going under the radar. I think Roma is probably the main one because they did get off to a very, very shaky start. But you've got all of the um, all of the top four from last season have kind of stumbled at the beginning. Uh, Boaz mentioned Inter's one win in the last eight. Juve have had a terrible start. I think this was their second worst points total um, at this stage of the season in the last decade. Uh, Lazio, obviously, we've discussed them at length, and Atalanta as well. And here, here we have Napoli, Milan, and Roma all currently in Champions League spots. So I think this is going to be a really, really exciting uh, title race this season. I'm not saying that it will end in this in this way, but certainly it's set up very, very nicely. Yeah, we will talk about Napoli in a second, but as you say, um, Roma sort of four wins from the last five. Obviously, that uh, that draw against Milan looking looking better and better by the day. Before we do move on to talk about Napoli, Baz, you wanted to mention uh, an Ivan Juric quote. Ivan Juric uh, is the Verona manager who played Milan earlier, so perhaps this would have been slightly better fitting earlier. But at the same time, it links up to what we were just sp- speaking about with Roma and also with Napoli coming up. Essentially, Juric said that, uh, wow, what a great Milan team to play again against it's not just Juventus in the league this year Roma are up there too Napoli are up there as well Inter as well it's going to be a really nice campionato indeed um so uh, yeah Napoli of course the other team that kind of capitalized on the other two draws uh Atalanta Inter and uh Lazio Juve the main talking point here is the uh Ossiman disallowed goal Napoli played uh almost a perfect game and dominated the, the match for 75 minutes Osimhen got a fantastic goal. His goal, his header was really easy, but uh, Lozano put in some amazing work and a superb cross for the goal. Which it's uh, and Lozano, as we've mentioned in past episodes, he looks like a player reborn. He, I think he was man of the match for this game. The, the amount of chances he created for his team. Ultimately, uh, there was then a disallowed goal for Napoli. Koulibaly bundled the goal over, uh, shot over. Once uh, after Osimhen brought the ball down, VAR brought it back, and uh, it was seen that Osimhen handballed it before the ball arrived to Koulibaly. But what bugs me about this is that um, essentially all, the only reason Osimhen touches it with his hand at all is because he's being pulled by the shirt and dragged down. And if the VAR is pulling it back to see the handball, then it should also see the foul for the penalty. And I should add, when I was uh, a young guy, I, I really wanted, I, I used to see a lot of injustices in Italian football, and I really wanted uh, some sort of uh, introduction of some electronic refereeing. Let's put it this way, I, it's like I had VAR posters up on my wall. and uh, <laughs> But this is not the, what I imagined at all, and if it's being called into play for certain episodes, but not some, and in some games it's, it is, it, it's become a bit of a farce, and I'd, I'd hate to be another podcast that goes on and on about VAR, but it's getting ridiculous in Italy. For my two cents, I'm going to throw into the, the ringer the my my argument for VAR. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the idea of VAR. My argument has always been that it should be a challenge system. Works in American football, works in works in tennis. Why not, why not use the same system in football? I just think I, I have to disagree with you there because I think adding another adversarial element between managers and referees is just not the way. You see, even when the referees are asked by their colleagues in the bar room to go and have a look, that they're reluctant to change their mind because they think their authority is being challenged. If that's coming from the manager of the team, you're just going to make the situation worse. Just let the VAR official make the decision. They're qualified referees. And this is the big issue in Italy that you kind of touch upon is that it, it really looks like there's some sort of an ego issue and that um, some people are don't want, are reluctant to go to VAR because it might make, make them look bad. But realistically, making these horrible decisions is what makes them ba- look bad. But I agree. going back to the game, um, as I said, Napoli dominated for a good 75 minutes, created a ton of chances. And then uh, Orsolini was one-on-one with Ospina and missed it from about uh, four meters out. And then there was also another shot from Palacio. So Napoli deserved the win. They're doing really well. Their stats are amazing for goals conceded. And they are they look fantastic up front. Shout out also to Bakayoko, who kind of uh, was immense and kind of uh, manages to be the pin between that attack and midfield and allows them to attack in numbers. 
Absolutely. And they sit on 14 points uh, joint with Roma, one place ahead of them going into the international break. Definitely be interesting to see where we are at the Christmas break, at the winter break. Anyway, we don't have time to round up the rest of the games, um, but just quickly the results. So Sassuolo and Udinese played out a nil-nil draw. Cagliari won 2-0 at home against Sampdoria. Benevento losing 3-0 away to Spezia, uh, home to Spezia, sorry. And uh, another goalless draw between Torino and Crotone. Uh, anything to add on any of those? Just uh, sounds like a lot of very dire games besides the Spezia game, which was a nice surprise from Vinny Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Good to get a shout out in for Vinny Italian. So yeah, we heading now into the international break. As mentioned, Italy facing Estonia first in a friendly, uh, followed by Nations League clashes with Poland and then Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mancini won't be with them due to also testing positive for COVID. Uh, however, former Milan player Alberigo Ivani, the assistant, will be taking charge. So best of luck to him, and we will bring you our reaction to the Poland game next week. Uh, before we wrap this up, let's have a few honourable dishonourable mentions. Baz, you can kick us off with a dishonourable for Roberto Martinez. So I think given that uh, Lukaku played 15 minutes against Atalanta, maybe this is a little bit harsh on my part. But nonetheless, it's a little bit ridiculous that uh, Lukaku, who's been out injured for a few weeks, has been called up for the Belgium side to play in these next few games. I don't think the travel will help his injury. I don't think the extra stress with COVID around. I understand that I'm kind of going back on what I said a few weeks back, where I felt that these internationals have to go ahead. But at the same time, I I think that a little bit of common sense could help. Yeah, I wonder, because Hazard has tested positive for COVID, hasn't he? Um, After being recalled to the Belgian national team, I wonder whether there's a bit of mistrust between the... uh, Conte is just waiting for this, you know? This is what's going to make his head explode. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, uh, over to you, Kenny, for a frankly ridiculous quote from Latito on, in reaction to being asked about play, his players testing positive. Yeah, so Latito's response to this, and I've got this, again, I've got this down in front of me because I want to get it right. It was, positive means contagious, right? There are bacteria in the vaginas of all women around, women in the world, That doesn't mean they're pathogens. Only in some cases do they become pathogens and degenerate. (laughs) I mean, what are you on about, mate? What what, what does that mean? Lotito gets mentioned every week now with this crazy stuff. I mean, I don't don't know where to go from that, really. Yeah, I'm not sure how he ended up there or um, where we should go next. Uh, But Boaz, you can uh, decide our destiny for us. For a change, I'm going to start with a dishonorable mention and end on a nice note. You briefly mentioned it earlier, but I really have to give a dishonorable mention to Sassuolo and Udinese. Their match on Friday night, which opened up the game week, they each had a XG of 0.11, which, I mean, come on, guys. You're, you're, Sassuolo are supposed to be a team that are challenging for supposedly challenging for Europe. I think maybe we gave them a little bit too much credit in those first few games. Everyone's entitled to an off night, I think. Yeah, but they also had that draw against Torino, who are not doing too well themselves. So I think maybe the win against Napoli is the odd game out rather than the other way around. Maybe Kirikas decided he needed to do some defending. Uh, <laughs> anyway, you want to want to finish us off with the Destiny one, Buzz? So Verona brought on uh, 17-year-old Destiny Udoje in the match against Milan at San Siro. And he's the youngest debutant in the league this year, beating we Aaron Hickey. So uh, again, it's nice to see some fresh talent in Serie A as on the other side of the spectrum to the various Zlatans and Cristiano Ronaldo's. Yeah, and he was thrown in right at the deep end, wasn't he? Uh, 20 minutes to go against Milan in the face of an onslaught as, uh, as the Rossoneri were searching for an equalizer. Which they managed to get. And he gave a pretty good account of himself considering his age. Yeah, we won't hold him fully responsible. All right, that is all we've got time for this week. Um, Please do subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your audio. Uh, We'll be back to speak about the international action next week. Until then, enjoy the football. Campione d'Italia per la stagione 2000-2001. Il titolo